This is Somewhere in the Skies with Ryan Sprague. Hey guys, Ryan hopping in before this week's episode. I'm currently working on some top secret projects that I should be able to share with you all very soon. This has left me with very little time between my day job here in New York City and time to produce a new show this week. So I decided to unlock one of our most popular Patreon episodes to all of you. This was an extended conversation with UFO researcher David Marler. We chatted for over two hours over on the main podcast feed, all about his work into researching the Black Triangle UFO phenomenon. So if you haven't heard that episode, I'd highly suggest checking it out. It's number 203 in the archives. But there was also one case that Marler personally investigated that always intrigued me, and that was a little-known UFO incident in which a child was badly burned by a UFO. Marler hopped over to Patreon to give us another half hour of his in-depth research on a case in 1964 in Hobbs, New Mexico, where Charles Keith Davis, a young boy at the time, noticed something strange in the sky that seemed to be getting closer. As this object ascended, Charles noticed a bright flame bursting from it. Soon, he was entirely engulfed in a fiery blaze. And that was only the beginning. In this episode, Marler walks us through the case and shares exclusive audio from the boy's grandmother. Marler also shares exclusive audio from an interview he conducted with Charles 57 years after that harrowing day. I sincerely hope you enjoy this Patreon unlock and know that it's just a small example of bonus content you'll receive when supporting us over on Patreon. To learn more and to become a patron, visit patreon.com slash somewhere skies. My special thanks to David Marler and a very special thanks, as always, to you for listening. Keep looking up and enjoy. Welcome, everyone, to a very special bonus Patreon episode of Summer in the Skies with our guest, David Marler. If you didn't listen to the feature-length episode over on the main feed, please go check that out. Over two hours of just an incredible conversation with um, one of the best UFO researchers out there today. And he is actually giving us so much of his time tonight. He's going to tell us about a very interesting case out of 1964 that has uh, physiological effects on a witness. I'm going to bring him in right now for our Patreon feed. David, welcome back to Somewhere in the Skies. Thank you, Ryan. I appreciate it. Yeah, this is a a very interesting case. Uh, This is one I read about years ago when I was really very young in the UFO field and just kind of trying to glamour on to anything I could in the way of information. Um, And actually, uh, APRO, the Aerial Phenomenon Research Organization, uh, did an article on this in their APRO Bulletin in 1964. And 64 was a pivotal year. Uh, this occurred in Hobbs, New Mexico, which for those that have gone to Roswell, New Mexico, Hobbs is even further to the southeast from Roswell. So it's really out in the middle of nowhere. And um, this occurred on June 2nd, 1964. And what's intriguing about this is it just wasn't the sighting of a UFO it was the sighting in an apparent burn case where an eight-year-old boy who was the primary witness in this case was burned uh, by flames that came from head to toe, yet he was only burned from his jawline up. And so I'll set the stage for this, but I just want to kind of start off by letting you know what we're going to be talking about. Uh, what's interesting about this, though, Despite the uh, severe nature of it, it really wasn't investigated thoroughly other than an article written by uh, Coral and Jim Lorenzen with APRO in 1964. Uh, Four years later, uh, one of my 
huge uh, mentors, if you will, even though I never knew him because he died <laughs> years before I was involved in UFOs, Dr. James McDonald, who I think is truly one of the, the best UFO researchers that ever existed. Uh, James McDonald uh, was getting interested in UFOs in the mid 60s and started looking into some of these older cases. And in 1968, he had stumbled across this case from 1964. Uh, I was able to uh, get copies of some audio recordings he had done in 68 with the eight-year-old boy who is now 12 <clears throat> and the mother and the grandmother. Now, what's interesting is uh, this is not just a solitary witness case. Uh, the grandson, the boy uh, who was eight years old, was burned and saw the object, but so too did the grandmother who was only standing about eight to 12 feet away when this whole episode occurred. Now, to set the stage, uh, Hobbs, New Mexico, you know, very small uh, mainstream America town. Uh, the family owned a series of businesses in Hobbs, New Mexico, one of which was the uh, local laundromat. And in this particular case, uh, Charles, who is the name of the boy, Charles had just arrived there. And he stated to me in later interviews that the the family businesses were kind of like a second home, you know, when the, the parents were working or the grandparents were working, he would just kind of hang out while, while they did their work after school or on weekends. And he had arrived at the laundromat. The laundromat sits on one of the main uh, streets in Hobbs, New Mexico. Immediately behind the laundromat was just a dirt parking lot. And as Charles told me, even though the, there was the front door off the main street, more often than not, people would just pull into the back and go in the back entrance. So Charles is playing. This is around roughly four in the afternoon, and it was a nice sunny day uh, in June in New Mexico. And he was playing when all of a sudden he looks up and he sees what he described as a black top shaped looking object, uh, kind of rounded on top and then pointed at the bottom. And, uh, he looked at this and immediately knew this was something out of the ordinary. And he said, I instinctively felt like it was looking at me and I felt like I just had to move. So he moved to the left, the object, which was hovering over a building across the alley from immediately behind the lot where he was playing, uh, moved to the left. It mimicked his behavior. He then moved to the right and then the object moved to the right. It was like mirroring his behaviors he then crouched down behind a little concrete block that was there uh, in the middle of the lot. And then he stood up and moved to the left or right again, at which point when he stood up, the object moved towards him like a bullet, as he described it. Instinctively, he flinched and put his arms up and closed his eyes. He said just instinctively. It's like it, he said he even told me uh, in my interview it's like if you're out in the street and you see a car coming and you know you don't have time to move, you just instinctively kind of do this. When he did this, the object moved directly over his head, about a foot above his head, belched flames down, which at this point, the grandmother's attention was drawn to him. She was standing in the back door of the laundromat. And when the object moved at him like a bullet, she heard a whooshing sound. And that's what drew her attention to look out the back door of the laundromat where she saw her grandson with this object above him and helplessly she watched this rain of fire come belching out of the bottom of this object. She described, and this is what's interesting about the case is not only what happened, but what didn't happen. She described to McDonald in 68 and in other news accounts, because this was documented in the local newspapers that the fire came out and bathed him from head to toe. And then the fire went back up into the object and the object took off and made another whooshing sound. Now, as you could imagine, the grandmother was shocked and horrified. And even four years later, you hear the guilt in her voice talking to Dr. James McDonald because she didn't do anything to, like, protect him or save him from enduring this. I looked out and my grandson was standing there and under this fire. It looked like a... Um black thing uh, with three burners, and it was right over his head, was standing straight up. And I was so astonished that I couldn't say anything. I could see him, and under this fire, this fire had him all covered to the ground. And I could see him, and under this fire, 
and and I could see him trying to say something, and uh, just a few minutes, he screamed, and this thing just like that and left. And he ran to me, and when he did, the uh, the outside of his uh, flesh was falling off of his face, and uh, the hair was burned on his forehead uh, so far up. It had burned uh, the top of his hair off. And um, I grabbed him real quick, and uh, the lady that was there with me uh, said, oh, put some water on it. And I said, no. But about that time, uh, I, I pulled him away from me. He was locked around my waist. And uh, uh, I said to him, I said, uh, oh, um, the skin was falling off of his face. And so about that time, uh, his grandpa, grandfather, uh, my first husband, uh, drove up and I said, uh, a Charles is burned real bad. Take him to the uh, doctor. And uh, so he uh, taken him to the hospital, to the emergency room. And what's interesting about this is we don't just take this boy or now man's testimony at face value. Uh, McDonald interviewed, you know, the boy, the grandmother and uh, the mother four years after the event. More importantly, we have contemporaneous reports in the form of the newspaper articles, which literally chronicled the whole episode from when it happened to the subsequent days and how his recovery was doing in the hospital. So we have all of this well-documented from the time period. The other thing that's interesting is in the newspaper accounts, the local police were investigating this case, trying to figure out what happened. You know, did the grandmother abuse the boy? What's going on? Did it really happen? And what's interesting, Ryan, is as you read the day by day, play by play in the newspaper, they start off very skeptical. They think initially, well, maybe he was playing with matches. Well, maybe he was near one of the air vents to the laundromat and a, and a piece of lint that caught fire blew and hit his head. They were trying like UFO investigators to find every practical explanation possible. And at the end of this whole period of like a week, week and a half of newspaper articles, you see systematically all those prosaic explanations go by the wayside. And they were left with a question mark. They didn't know what happened. But none of the other experts, they looked for matches. They couldn't find any matches. They looked to see, was there any dryer vent stuff that blew out and might have caught fire? They couldn't find anything like that. Uh, they looked for accelerant. You know, was he playing with gasoline and somehow set, set it on? They couldn't find any accelerant. Another interesting uh, insight that the newspaper accounts afford us is the fact that the FBI was called in. And the FBI... Uh, had the skin scrapings of the boy's skin, hair, his T-shirt that he wore, and the grandmother's, there's different accounts. One says her blouse, the other one says an apron she was wearing. But whatever she was wearing, where he made con direct contact immediately after, they, they took that as well. And it was sent off to the FBI laboratories for analysis. In 1968, the mother, with a lot of consternation in her voice, said, you know, the FBI never did get back with us and tell us anything. And, and my grandmother was mad because she never did get her blouse back. <laughs> <laughs> so um, so um, long story short, I ran across these recordings. And without going into a lot of detail, I was able to track down the eight-year-old boy. Uh, he actually changed his name. Nothing to do with the UFO case. But his mother later remarried, and then he took on his adopted father's name. So nothing nothing nefarious, nothing to do with a UFO cover-up or anything like that. But I was able to track him down after realizing this, after kind of piecing together different elements. And I was able to find him. He still lives in south, the southwest portion of the United States. And I uh, interviewed him repeatedly. Uh, he has a, a, a business in the town where he lives. Uh, he's an upstanding citizen. Uh, you know, he's well known within the community, although he's never publicly talked about any of this. Um, and then um, I've gotten to know his wife as well. And his wife and he both told me, until you came along, my wife has never heard this whole story. She knew about it after we had been dating and we knew we were going to get married. I eventually told her about it. And she would always periodically say, do you want to tell me more about what happened in 64? Do you want to talk about that incident? And he said, no, never. He goes, it's not until you came to talk about this that she's finally heard the full story. 
And then subsequent to that, I found all the newspaper articles, which they didn't have. And I found a lot of additional information. I filed a FOIA request with the FBI relative to the FBI laboratory analysis of what they collected. And I immediately got a letter of reply back uh, stating that because it involves third party individuals and privacy issues, I could not request that information. So I sat there for all of 10 seconds and thought, okay, well, I know the guy who it happened to. So I redrafted the FOIA in his name, sent it to him, and it said, Charles, and I call him Chuck. He goes by Chuck. Um, I said, Chuck, do you mind resubmitting this in your name? Because they can't say it's third party and we can't release it. So he submitted that uh, right before COVID. And we don't know where they're at with FOIA requests right now because of COVID. So we don't know if it's just tied up in red tape or if it's in the queue and they'll eventually get to it. But he did resubmit that in his name. It'd be really interesting if we found something after all yeah. these years. Hi, everyone. My name is Andy, and I host That UFO Podcast. That UFO Podcast brings you weekly content with some of the biggest names from around the world of UFOs, UAP, and associated phenomena. Weekly interviews, roundtable discussions, and breaking news podcasts with myself, regular co-host Dan, and sometimes special guests will drop in too. That UFO Podcast is available on Apple Podcasts, Spotify, and wherever you can download podcasts. Already having hosted names like Luis Elizondo, Sean Cahill, George Knapp, Avi Loeb, Brandon Fugel, Ralph Blumenthal, and many more. I hope you come and check us out, and as always, keep looking up, you never know what you might see. As your audience is sitting there thinking, well, Dave said the police investigated. I also consulted with the Hobbs New Mexico Police Department. Oh, okay. I have to tell you, they were extremely professional, regardless of what I was asking for, you know, being involved in UFO research. They were, it was all via email and phone, but they were extremely polite and respectful. And they said, you know, Dave, when did that happen? I said, well, it happened in 1964, June 2nd, 1964. They said, well, we have some historic records going back, uh, but we don't know how far back they go. And we also have some old ones on microfilm, but they were very kind and they checked and they said, you know, Dave, we did go through our microfilm holdings. We don't have anything that goes back even close to 1964. So, but they did check, which was at least nice. And I was going to check with the hospital. And actually I did call. I work in healthcare. I've been in healthcare for over 20 years. I know what the record retention laws are today with regard to medical retention. And you're lucky if they keep anything beyond 10 years, let alone this span of time. But they didn't know who I was. And I just called and I said, I have a, I'm calling on behalf of a friend who had a, a, a bad accident back in 1964. And I was just curious if you had any, I had to at least call to say I did it. Otherwise I'm not a good researcher. And they kind of almost laughed that no, we don't have records going back that far. So I did consult with the hospital as well. So our best, our best case scenario is if we can get the FBI laboratory results and um, not that it may tell us much other than, well, it was burned. There was no accelerant detected, but at least it's one more piece of validation that the FBI was involved beyond. Exactly. Charles remembers the FBI being there, uh, as he said, you know, when you're eight years old and you're in the hospital and, you know, these 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 government guys come in and they've got, you know, sidearms. He goes, as when you're eight years old, that's cool. He goes, you remember. Yeah. That. And so he remembered that. And he also said that he felt like the FBI treated him uh, with a little bit more respect and less skepticism than the local police did, which I thought was an interesting observation for an eight year old to kind of pick up on that and remember it. But um, he's never talked about this publicly since it happened. He really just wanted to move on with his life. He, and I have to emphasize this, again, for the skeptics out there, did not believe in UFOs before, did not think this was a UFO other than a true unidentified flying object, and even today would not consider himself a UFO believer. He and his family were devout Pentecostals back in 1964. I think that's very important. These are not the people that are going to concoct a UFO story. This is the furthest thing probably from their reality. Um, and so, again, they were upstanding business people. They had multiple businesses. There's no reason that they would want to do this to ruin their reputation by concocting a story like this. Um, but, um, you know, it's a, a well-documented case. James McDonald followed up on it and then kind of following in his footsteps. I wanted to track this guy down years later, one, because – other than McDonald doing phone interviews, that was the extent of the investigation. And even Coral and Jim Lorenzo with APRO, they never made a trip to Hobbs. So it was all done by phone. And so 
how could you not investigate this case? I mean, it's physical evidence of something very traumatic occurring. And so uh, I went to the University of New Mexico where I do a lot of historical research. They have exhaustive microfilm holdings for newspapers that aren't digitized. One of those are the Hobbs New Mexico newspapers, which gave me all these additional details and verification in addition to some other newspapers from the regional area, the county newspaper. And even there were as the reports went as far as Lubbock and Ode- Odessa, Texas, where I found some additional references. Um, but despite the fact he was covered in fire, he was only burned from the jawline up. Uh, there was slight redness to his neck and in, in, in the back, but not severe. It was more like a sunburn. But uh, the newspaper accounts uh, state that he had suffered second degree burns. Um, The mother, grandmother and boy attested to the fact in 68 that it was second and third degree burns. And even today, Charles says, well, it was second and third degree burns. The most bizarre thing is, despite being bathed head to toe, he only had the injuries here. It's interesting because the descriptions in the newspaper mirror what James McDonald was told by the, the, the grandmother and the mother they said his ears were so severely burned, they were turned inside out and looked like ground beef. His lips were swelled and burned, and his face had swelled up so bad you couldn't even see his eyes. They were sunken in because the face had swelled so bad. And so, I mean, severe injuries, but the most bizarre thing, and again, documented in the newspapers from the time. I mean, this is all confirmed. We're not taking the witnesses. Despite this craziness, these inconsistencies, Adding to the inconsistencies is the fact he had no permanent scarring. Wow. I, I, there was some sort of deformity, right? No f- deformity. I, I, when I first met the man and, and he, you know, we talked, the whole time I'm doing the initial interview, and I've interviewed him like three or four times now, the, the whole time I'm just sitting there and I'm like scanning his head, his face, his ears, his lips. I mean, looking at his neck. And I'm like, and I finally said at one point on the videotaped interview, because it started with audio interviews and then I, I built a trust. And I'm happy to say now I'm very good friends with him and his wife, as is my wife, who went down to do help assist with the interviews. Um, he um, can't explain it. I'm Charles Keith Davis from Hobbs, New Mexico. And in 1964, I encountered a strange object during daylight hours at my grandparents' laundry mat that appeared over some apartment buildings that was in the shape of a top that was been described as a UFO or whatever you want to describe it, but it followed me and swooped on my body and gave me second and third degree burns on my face. My grandmother witnessed part of it, Grady Smith, and I don't know what it was, I just know that I encountered something very unusual that we've kind of kept under the closet for 55 years. And uh, up until Dave came, we haven't talked about it much. It's kind of been like, I'm not going to say a family secret, but there's so many skeptics out there that it's not something you want to talk about. And if you ask me what it is or what it was, I don't know. I just know it wasn't something you see every day or I've ever seen in my lifetime again. If it was domestic or from outer space, I have no idea, Mm -hmm. no idea at all. Mm -hmm. I just know that I saw it, it swooped toward me, engulfed my body. When it left, I had second and third degree burns from my face up. I, I just remember feeling engulfed. I don't remember feeling it burning me. The best I could describe, it's engulfed and maybe you're gasping for air because you have a lack of oxygen. I just knew when it engulfed me, something was wrong, real wrong. You know what I mean? Mm -hmm. Excuse my dumb terminology. Not regular wrong, but serious wrong. Right. And I needed to get out of this engulfment. And I just remember, like, somebody grabbed me, but nobody was grabbing me. I was just engulfed. Yeah, I was engulfed. And there was an immediate panic. But in hindsight, and I'm being very sincere, I think I would have, I knew something was wrong when it, right. I, you know, you know something's wrong. Right. But 
when it actually engulfed me, something was real wrong. Mm -hmm. I don't know how to describe that. I don't think I felt the sense that I was going to die, but I felt the sense I had to get away from it. Sense of dread. I had, uh, I had to get away now. Yeah. Or it was going to be tragic. Okay. But okay. I felt no pain. I saw no fire. I, more than anything, I remember them telling me my face and my hair was on fire. Mm -hmm. But I don't remember feeling pain at that point. But I think I was in shock. I know they brought in the FBI, the Hobbs Police Department, and uh, to this day we still don't have answers. I know they took part of my clothing to check it for evidence, they checked the area I was burned, and 55 years later I'm going to tell you there's no answers any more than we had the day that the occurrence occurred. Mm -hmm. I, I asked him, I said, Chuck, I said to look at you today and to hear your description of what transpired in 64, I said, how do you account for no injuries, no scars? And his his answer, is, it's just typical Chuck. If you get to know him, he's like, the only thing I can tell you is the strangest things are true. All these years, he and his family amongst themselves labored under the idea that whatever this thing was, it must have been some military craft that went off course from White Sands Proving Ground and somehow inadvertently burned him. That was pretty much how they resolved it in their mind. And they just made peace with it and moved on with their lives. And he told me, and this is a whole other, another show, I guess, Ryan, that this is what I guess we call a teaser in investigating that case because it was so compelling. And the witness still after decades later is still going by their story and the details I might add, the details he gave me matched what McDonald had noted and matched what the Lorenzans had noted. There was no deviation in the reports. It was still consistent. Um, but what was interesting is the fact that, you know, as, as I'm interviewing him and talking to him, uh, I started to think, OK, this is a very compelling case. Are there other cases out there? And again, big picture, as I always like to call myself, looking at patterns in the data, I found out that four weeks to the day. And this is an interesting thing. The sighting happened on Tuesday, June 2nd for Chuck when he was burned. Four weeks later, Tuesday. In Livonia, Georgia, we had a businessman that was documented in Project Blue Book files, documented in numerous newspaper accounts from the time period, which I have. Uh, a businessman driving home around one in the morning had his arm out of the car, driving on a hot summer night in, in Georgia, had a top-shaped UFO fly around his vehicle, made three or four passes, had burners on the underside, which he sketched, where fire was belching out. And the words that the grandmother used to Dr. McDonald and to others, she said it was a black top-shaped object with burners on the underside. And this black <laughs> top-shaped object flew around this gentleman's car, left markings on the vehicle itself, and burned his arm, which was sticking out. Not severely, but enough to, to cause redness and, and a little bit of swelling. Um, the Air Force was notified. They pretty much discounted it. Um, the newspaper accounts chronicled it in, in very good detail. What's interesting is the same Tuesday, other witnesses had cited the top shaped UFO. And in the two to three weeks after that, on Tuesdays, multiple witnesses within an 85 mile radius of northeast Georgia all described a black top shaped object belching fire. So the same object belching fire reported by multiple witnesses and all of them occurred on Tuesday nights until around the second or third week in July, a report in the newspaper popped up and there was a sighting on a Thursday. And after that, it's almost like, for lack of a better term, the cycle was broken and there were no more reports. What it means, wow. Ryan, I have no freaking clue. <laughs> I, I, can only, I can only report the data. What it means, I don't know. But it really bolsters and reinforces the validity of what Chuck described because his was the first sighting. And then again, expanding the parameters of the historical research, going through my databases and going through the files I have here, Jacques Vallée in one of his very early books described one of the best European cases ever in an area called Vinsor Carame in Southeast France, where it was one of the best documented European UFO cases where the witnesses described a top-shaped UFO. And I took the sketch that Chuck gave me, I took the sketch the witnesses provided, 
it's identical in shape and dimensions, even more so. And this is an obscure case for someone that's not into UFOs. You really have to right. look hard to find this one. And what's interesting is the dimensions in feet that Chuck provided me just in the last two years since I started interviewing him in width and height matched the dimensions with a very small, small margin of error to the sketch that was sketched in 1957 uh, of this French top shaped object, only they described it in meters. But when you convert the meters to feet, it was the same basic dimensions. Wow. <laughs> that That's insane. Not only, I mean, just not only the dimensions, but just the fact that it happened on another continent and at a different French, time period. And the French case, it, it was the same object and it was bobbing and moving in a very similar fashion, but it didn't have any fire in that particular case. But there was some magnetization of some street signs where the object had flown past. So, yeah. And then uh, even further back than that, if that's not good enough, in Project Blue Book Files, I found a case from 1952 in Leveland, Texas, which is just about 80 to 85 miles northeast of Hobbs. And it was a Blue Book case, which they labeled unidentified, I might add. They didn't say it was just ball lightning or the planet Venus. Two witnesses observed two top-shaped objects that were revolving, and they described fire, smoke, or steam that was jettisoning out the bottom. Hmm. There you go. Again, the data doesn't lie. That's these incredible. Are random people making stuff up. We're not going to find consistencies like that in disparate reports that these people could not have been aware of at the time when they made these exactly. reports. And, you know, I mean, the researcher in me goes back to the whole scheduled Tuesday thing. Like, I, I'm thinking maybe it, that was the night that they were testing some experimental aircraft that would explain flames it would explain this that but we don't know and i think it's important uh for someone like chuck to say i don't know what happened to me i mean that's yeah. pro possibly the best answer he could give well what's funny is i presented this information once i started really putting it all together and i went back and i met with chuck and his wife and i presented all this and he sat there and you got to know chuck he is the most normal person you could ever meet just the average joe but he sits there and he, he leans back like this and he's stroking his mustache. And he's like, you know, all these years I labored under the idea it was something military. I didn't even think about UFOs. But he goes, I have to tell you, after you shared all this with me, you got me thinking. It's like, was it something else? So he's not sure. He'll tell you he doesn't know what it was. And he said, we'll probably never know what it was. But he goes, it was there. And, you know, the facts it are. Happened. facts are. Yeah. And so... Um, so yeah, that, that was an interesting kind of series of revelations, seeing how this pattern emerged, what it means again, I don't know, but again, it just, I, I don't mean to sound like a broken record. It underscores why we have to have access to as much data as possible. And we can start finding those. There are patterns in the data. We just need to find them. It's kind of like Michelangelo, right? When he carved David, he saw the statue in the stone. He just had to chip the rest away. It's just like, that's how we are. We, we got to yeah. find those patterns. They're there. Uh, I'm certain of it. It's just taking the time and it takes a lot of research. To, you know, it's separating the wheat from the chaff. But when you have these cases involving physiological effects, when you have these cases that have been documented well in newspaper accounts, it goes beyond just taking the eyewitness testimony at face value. And um, it's, it's fascinating. And that's what, again, fuels me. Uh, you know, finding these things that we didn't know about before and Chuck thinking what happened was just an isolated case. And just to provide context, Chuck's sighting happened June 2nd, 1964. It was April 24th, 1964, just a few months before we had the Lonnie Zamora sighting here in New Mexico. 64 was a huge wave of UFO sightings in New Mexico, which was really typified by the, the Lonnie Zamora sighting, which had garnered more media attention than any of the others. Yeah, there has to be some sort of connection. If anyone can make it, Dave, I know it's you, my man. So no pressure. <laughs> yeah, right. No pressure. Thank you for sharing that story Absolutely. with our Patreon subscribers. Um, but uh, before we go, of course, for them listening, uh, where can we find everything you're up to and where can we find your book? Sure, absolutely. Uh, the best place is my website, www.davidmarler, M-A-R-L-E-R, -E 
ufo.com. Uh, there's a link there for Amazon. Uh, I mentioned before, there's a, a bad Amazon link that's floating around out there. Some people said I clicked on it and it said your book's not available. It is available. Uh, just go to my website. The link's right on the main page, as well as some of the, the work I've done with uh, Chris on Unidentified and uh, the phenomenon and some other things. So uh, yeah, never a dull moment, Ryan. There's always something to do. <laughs> <laughs> Absolutely, man. And you, you're you doing it. So I got to thank you for all the work you've done and for Thanks. sticking around for this bonus episode with us. So, Happy to do thank so. You. Absolutely. Thank you. Somewhere in the Skies is produced by Third Kind Productions in association with the Entertainment One Podcast Network.